Hey, shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back. I thank you again uh, for joining me. Oh, uh, today I want to I want to share an article that I found. Uh, I've been going through my notes, my notebooks, uh, other folders, articles, and things, coming up, and finding uh, interesting articles I'd like to read to you. And uh, this one uh, was about a, a discovery. It was uh, it's like a, a sanctuary for religious freedom, and it goes back, you know, back in the past. And I just want to read this to you because I thought it would be, you know, enlightening to you and educational and something I just wanted to share with you. But the article, unfortunately, doesn't have the author and I apologize. That's how I was. I used Back in the day, I used to get on there and print out articles and everything. And for some reason, names weren't there. If it was, an, you know, the author, if he's a professor, pastor, whoever, or, or historian, you know, whatever, just some reason it just didn't 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 crop up uh but anyways it says here re, and this is probably about 20 years ago recently discovered church records and personal journals have uh, disclosed much of what was previous previously unknown about the first recorded church in america this vital information was researched in the early to mid 1980s casting fascinating light on the early phase of church history in the American colonies. The first evidence of the Church of God in America is found in Rhode Island. This was the ideal place for the church to grow because it was the only colony whose charter specifically guaranteed religious freedom without persecution. Most of the other American colonies were far less tolerant of those uh, outside whatever was the lo locally sanctioned religion. Uh, for example, Puritan colonies such as Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut held strict intolerance toward other religious creeds. Therefore, Rhode Island gradually became a refuge, a refuge and a haven for Quakers and the Sabbatarians, as well as fundamentalists known as Baptists, naturally all of these sought freedom from persecution and Rhode Island offered it. So in other words, it was a sanctuary. When Sabbath, keep, uh, Sabbath keeper uh, Stephen Mumford arrived in 1664 in the Rhode Island city of Newport, there were, to his uh, knowledge, no Sabbatarian churches anywhere else in the colonies. There, he and his wife associated for a time with a group of religious fundamentalists. Although the group called themselves Baptists, they were not like uh, Protestants of today. They did not uh, tolerate such things as crosses or steeples and basically sought to follow strictly what the Bible taught. Even their name reflected the correct belief in baptism by immersion. The Protestant Reformation had only occurred a few decades before uh, this time, and the standard Protestant uh, theology generally following the precepts of Rome had not yet been fully established. In time, Mumford sought to preach the truth to others. He followed the examples given in the book of Acts, chapter 18, 28, and chapter 9, verse 8, and his approach to this. He did not try to siphon off members, but rather to make the truth known and allow others to act upon their conviction. In 1670, uh, seven people began meeting at the Mumford home where they made a covenant with Yahweh to keep all of his uh, commandments. Those who initially came with the Mumfords were primarily the main leadership of the church that they had been attending. Ten years later, in 1680, the number meeting uh, the number meeting with the Mumfords in Newport had only increased to 11, but the real growth was beginning to develop in the southwestern part of the colony. About this time, the church began publishing uh, small pa uh, pamphlets and tracts. These were also handed out in Connecticut and Massachusetts, where gatherings on the Sabbath were illegal. Interest grew. And with more immigration, response, uh, responses increased, especially from these adjacent uh, Puritan colonies. Also in 1680, a church building was strategically located at Westerly, Rhode Island, on the border of Connecticut to accommodate the influx of new members. 
growth continued in the region, in that region, mainly from the uh, pamphlets being made available, especially in Connecticut. After the turn of the century, although he was never the pastor, Mumford continued as patriarch of the church in Rhode Island until his death in 1707. A number of uh, fervent, uh, dedicated ministers had served the brethren during this time, such as William Hiscox, uh, William Bliss, and others. Uh, by 1730, there were 1,000 members at Westerly with 2,000 in attendance on a regular basis. The Westerly Church came to be known as the largest church in all the colonies of any denomination. This growth uh, necessitated the building of a new church erected five miles away at Hopkinton to help uh, accommodate the influx of new members. The membership in Rhode Island included a number of prominent people. The majority of the founders of what later became Brown University were Sabbatarians who attended the church in Rhode Island. Also among the members were the governor of the colony, Richard Ward, and his son, Samuel Ward, who went on to become governor himself. We have seen, uh, yeah, it is also interesting that the church buildings of these Sabbatarians always displayed a plaque of the Ten Commandments above and behind the speaker. Even the grave markers of those who died in the 1600s and early 1700s conveyed expressions of the fact that they had been Sabbath keepers and were awaiting the resurrection of the dead, generally only really understood by true Christians. And the, and the article ends, ends right there, but it's just a fascinating piece of America, uh, history in the, in the colonies, United States, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Christian Christian history as well. And that you know, back then it was uh, a lot of people, a lot of church people were persecuted by other church people for not believing in the same thing they believed. So instead of debating them and and being civilized and disputing them, they they wanted to hurt them. They wanted to. Uh, Put them in submission, uh, get them out of the way, one way or another. If it's taking away a life or injuring somebody or whatever, that's what what would happen. It was totally unnecessary and crazy back then, but thankfully now we got the religious freedoms to, you know, dictate what you know what we believe and things like that. So that that's an article I wanted to share with you, and I've got other articles and I'll share share them with you in the future and. Let you know what to think. Comment below. Let me know what you think about it. It's a nice little history lesson, history for the United States and also history uh, for uh, the church, of course. And uh, that's all I want to say right now. I thank you again for joining me. Give me a big thumbs up and hit that notification bell and also subscribe. I'd appreciate that. And until we meet again, friends, peace out and shalom.